Hey, are you ready to grow your business? You have checked out the number one resource for business leaders, entrepreneurs, startup founders, and managers. And we're going to teach you how to grow and scale your business with real actionable steps. There's no fluff in this podcast. It's just good advice. Hey, on today's episode, we're talking about how you can guarantee great hires for your business. It's true. You can actually find amazing people to join your team. We're talking about all the things you should be doing, and more importantly, the things that you absolutely must never do. Otherwise, you're going to get some bad hires for the business. Hey, stay tuned. Here comes your good advice. All right. Hey, welcome back to another episode of the Good Advice Podcast. I appreciate you listening to the podcast today. It's Friday for me. I'm ready to enjoy an awesome weekend. And wrapping up a week of kind of insanity, we are hiring for a position in the business. It is a social media marketing manager uh, person, you know, whatever you call it, whatever you add on to it. And it's been it's been exciting. It's exciting because it's the business is growing. Um, I'll be really honest, like the social media game is something that has never been my skill set. It's never been my talent. It's never been something I've been very passionate about it. And so naturally, I'm excited to hand that off to someone else and have them manage it. So it's exciting stuff, exciting times. Um, if you like seeing good advice content, the good news is you're going to see more of it. Uh, you're going to see it on a more consistent pacing, on a more consistent basis. Um, the bad news is, if I guess, if you don't like social media content, why are you listening to the podcast? Uh, but there's going to be a whole lot more of me. So for better or worse, I'm here to stick around. And uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's exciting stuff. But the reason it's been so hectic is because as of this week, we've had 70 applications for the position. Um, I was kind of expecting maybe 10 to 15. Uh, there's been 70. It's been interesting in the sense of, um, well, let me back up a little bit. If you're, if you're new to the podcast, sorry, I don't mean to like jump all over the place, but if you're new to the podcast, what we do here is basically talk about business. What do you need to know about your business? What are some tips and insights you can use and apply to your business? And one of those insights that we try to share every time we hit record is ideally something that is tangible, practical. It's not theoretical. Um, I worked in a business in the past that was very abstract and theoretical and um, uh, thinking focused, which there's nothing wrong with that. But in some cases it would be like, yeah, I get that, but now what do I go do? Um, which was sometimes handled in that conversation and just wasn't always handled. And heck, that's my starting point. That's what I that's what I do for my customers is we talk the tangible, the actionable, the practical. And so having said that, I want to talk today about how do you guarantee great hires for your business? Now, there, I'll, I'll go and tell you I'm cheating a little bit because there is no tried and true perfect method that is going to get you that amazing employee in a chair in your office working for your business, what have you. There's no perfect way to do it. There's no, um, you know, hey, just do these three things and you'll never make a mishire. You'll never make a mistake in hiring. You'll always have the best person possible, yada, yada. It just won't happen. So that's my disclaimer, uh, you know, talking out of the other side of my mouth. But on the same token, we can at least guarantee that it's going to be almost perfect, if not very close to what you envision for that great hire for your business. And I'm living this right now with my own business as I'm hiring. I've been involved in hiring with a multitude of businesses in the past. This is not any new territory for me. And as someone who has worked in a leadership role, uh, who has been passionate about leadership, more importantly, has been passionate about not leadership from like a 30,000 foot view perspective, but you know, how do you actually have people who like working for you, who are high functioning, high performing? You know, you're not worried about what are they accomplishing week to week. You just know that they're the right people getting the right job done. 
hiring is a big piece of that. And so I want to share some of the some concepts that I've had from past conversations, uh, ways that I've coached my customers. And hopefully we'll both walk away today with you having a, a stronger understanding of how do you hire well. Now I'll go ahead and tell you, if you've been hiring for a long time, if you know some amazing insights yourself and you want to share them with me, uh, I'll take I'll take it. <laughs> Send it to me, Blake at goodadvicecoaching.com. I'd love to hear what works well for you. Uh, and naturally, if you've been listening to the podcast long term, you probably already know some of this stuff. You've probably checked out some of my previous content on managing your employees well and being basically a great boss. So having said that, let's talk a little bit about hiring in general, and then we'll talk um, some specifics today. Now, if you've ever hired before, you know that it's rarely quick and easy, uh, and in many cases, it can be incredibly aggravating or it can be incredibly painful. You know, you might have someone who, um, well, just telling a personal story, uh, I had someone uh, who I was hiring who I felt really good about, and I was about 70% there. We talked a little bit more and I kind of was kind of pulling back off it because as I was talking to this person, I was like, I just don't know if this person's that interested, uh, but the talent seemed to be there. And then finally, the conversation got to the point where it was kind of like, are you, are you sure you want this job? Like, you sure you want to apply for this? And then the person was like, yeah, no, I guess I don't really want to do this. And I was like, okay, I'm glad we, <laughs> I'm glad we figured this out like now, as opposed to, you know, you're a month in, you don't like working here. I don't like you working here, you know, et cetera. So point being, you know, you'll go through an applicant, you'll talk to an applicant, you'll go through the whole process. And then all of a sudden it's like, yeah, this isn't a good fit. Even when you thought it would have been a good fit. It's kind of the nature of hiring. It's the complexity of hiring. It's normal and you're not necessarily doing anything wrong. And in many cases, it might feel clunky and that's okay. But let's talk about what you should be doing when you're hiring and how do you hire well. So some general concepts, okay? Um, First of all, and this is something that's a bit challenging for you small business owners out there. When you hire someone, you are not hiring someone who is going to do everything that you don't want to do. And what I mean by this is, you know, you have in your business, as you run your business, you have a handful of things that you simply don't like doing. You're not going to find someone who loves your brand, who says, hey, literally whatever it is, social media, sales, invoicing, uh, you know, talking to difficult customers, um, budget planning, uh, I mean, I can't think of anything else, but you're not going to find someone who's who's savvy enough in all of these areas and who will gladly take these things off your plate. And if you do, that would be what we call a done for you service that's going to charge you quite a bit of money to do that for you. Most of my fellow small business owners, what we're often looking for is we're we're trying to find that person who can make our business run more effectively. And unfortunately, we find people who um, they they aren't great for the longevity of our business because in many cases, the stigma in hiring these positions out is it's a small business owner who hires someone on at a cheap rate and then begins to add on and tack on and overwhelm employees until they finally quit. So the way this commonly gets... Uh, illustrated is an employee who gets hired on to do social media, since that's the, the example we keep using today. They get hired on to do some content and the boss says, hey, would you mind just handling like some of this other general marketing stuff? Uh, yeah, I can do that. Oh, hey, by the way, you know, it's like two weeks go by. Hey, by the way, we need to get a blog up. Do you think you could write a blog for us? Uh, yeah, sure. Okay. I, I, of course I will. Uh, another few weeks go by. Hey, do you have any do you have any friends around who might want to buy from us or you know, hey, would you mind there's a networking event uh happening just down the street. Would you mind popping in and just talking about the business? And you're like, "Uh, yeah, sure." And you know, networking is really important for you. It might be really great for your career. So, you know, if you could just pop in and talk a little bit about the business, it's going to look really good on you too. Uh yeah, I I can do that. Um, Hey, we're really behind on invoicing. Do you think you could help out and help us? You know, we got to do some accounting stuff. We got to go through some bookkeeping stuff. Um, do you have a, do you have a, an afternoon you could sit down with me and we can kind of go through it together and just, and so do you see what's happening here is that in many cases, 
we try to overload someone because it's convenient. And I don't think we always do this maliciously, but you have to understand that the majority of your employees are well-meaning. They want to do right by you. They want to prove their worth and they're good people who are willing to help out. And so when you ask someone for help on an extra project that's outside of the parameters of what they've been hired to do, a lot of people are going to say yes. The problem with that is that you did not hire that person to do that task. And so what eventually happens is not only does it cause someone to get burned out because now they're handling 15 different things for your business, what also ends up happening is functionally it's not sustainable for your business because this person gets burnt out, they quit, and now the person that was now handling the 15 different facets of your business is no longer there. What are you going to do, right? It's, it's, it, there's no solution there that actually works. So bearing that in mind, you have to understand that hiring is not about the cheapest option. It's not about finding someone who's going to do everything for you. You might be able to hear my uh, toddler who's screaming in the background. Great timing. <laughs> Just kidding. Uh, but she's two. And so she has. we're working through some big feelings right now. So if you have advice on that, by the way, feel free to send it my way. So anyway, um, what was I saying? Oh, yeah. So you're, you're not looking for someone who's going to do everything. And also, you know, something else that's a bit weird in the hiring world is you're not hiring someone to mentor. And this is something that it's a bit weird, frankly, and awkward. In many cases, I have actually seen people hire young talent and they take like this odd paternal or maternal role where it's like, I'm, you know, I'm coaching them, I'm developing them. And, and it's not that, you, you know, don't, don't hear me incorrectly here. Of course, develop your people. Of course, mentor and give free advice for your people. But don't assume that you're doing them a favor by hiring them. And now you are like uh, Santa Claus who's gifting all these amazing gifts and insights. You know, the person who I'm hiring to do social media for me, I'm just trusting that person to do it. And if there's gaps in their professional ability, yeah, I'm going to coach them, but I'm hiring them under the assumption that they can already already do the job I need them to. Now, naturally, this gets different in like an internship, uh, in like an explicit like educational role. But if I'm hiring someone to teach them everything about the job and they're in the technical side of doing the job, why would I be hiring that person in the first place? You see what I'm saying? Like naturally you're hiring someone who you're trusting to do the job. And, and here's what's funny about the podcast, by the way, is a lot of times I talk about a concept and I say, hey guys, it's not rocket science, it's very simple. And yet, and I've even gotten pushback in the past where people are like, yeah, like what's, like that's nothing, there's nothing insightful about that. And yet we've probably all had the boss at some point who's hired you And you're ready to do the job and they say something along the lines of like, well, you're just not ready yet. You're not ready yet to do that task. And you're thinking, well, that that was in my original job description or, you know, bosses who are controlling, who are unwilling to delegate. They're unwilling to actually give you the things that you're supposed to be doing because they they, they're so used to doing it themselves. Um, Bosses who, um, you know, are suspicious of your daily activities. What are you working on? You know, who micromanage you, who don't just let you do the job. I had a friend of mine who was hired to, it was basically a chamber. uh, She was hired by a chamber to do, to be an event coordinator and to create events for the local community. So she gets hired. She immediately begins setting up the first big event and her boss basically pulls her in and scolds her, basically being like, why are you planning this event? And she's like, well, because that's what you've hired me to do. You've hired me to create events that bring in local businesses. And the boss basically says, no, um, I don't trust you yet. I don't trust you to do that yet. I need you, you need to prove to me that you deserve my trust. And once you do, then I will release you to go plan these events. And she was like, 
and there was no like mention of like a timeline. There wasn't like, and, and again, don't hear me incorrectly. I'm not saying there's not a training time or an onboarding time or anything like that. But even when you're onboarding someone, you know, you're, you're often acclimating them to your own like specific business processes. You're not usually teaching them how to do the job, right? Now there are some like some jobs that this does happen Maybe you're hiring someone, it's, it's part of your, your pressure washing business, and they don't know pressure washing, but they're a hard worker, you know, they, they could be a good fit. And so there's like the mechanics of it, but like the character and like the general skills are there. But point being, she was like, why did you hire me? Why did you hire me if I have to now earn? And also think about how this isn't profitable for a business. You've now hired someone and now you're paying them to sit in a chair because you are so insecure of getting burned that the job you filled isn't being done. In fact, you're doing the job because you don't trust that person to do it. Like, think about how silly that is. You're doing the job you paid someone else to do, and you're not running your business. That's the issue. So trust your people when you hire them to do the job you hired them to do. Otherwise, why did you hire them? That's the simple concept. So, so that's some of the general stuff. Let's talk specifics about hiring. Like what are some things that you're trying to do in an interview, in the hiring process, what have you? The first thing that I'll say, and I kind of alluded to this earlier, when you're hiring someone, you want to hire for a very specific role. And the reason for this is because there, there's incredible power when it comes to your culture of your business when there's clarity around who does what and who's responsible for what, who's accountable for what. It becomes very vague when people don't really know what they're supposed to be doing on a day-to-day basis. And more importantly, it's hard to judge if the business is moving forwards or backwards. So bearing that in mind then, what you wanna do is not hire someone who can do everything, Not only are you not going to find someone who can do that, they cost way too much and they don't want to come work for you. They don't care about your small business brand. Sorry. Um, You're not going to know how to hold them accountable. And uh, and, and like I said, they're not going to be good at all of these things equally, by the way. So stop trying to save a quick buck. Hire someone for a very specific task. And I think about someone who... um, uh, I saw them posting about a, a job offering for their business. They said, yeah, I need someone who can do everything. And I'm like, it's not going to take you anywhere. So here's, here's what you need to do. And, and there may be, by the way, several big issues with your business that you need to have addressed. This is the challenge to you as a business owner is developing your strategic acumen of recognizing what is most important for your business. This is not always what you're most passionate about. Sometimes in business, there's things that you're deeply passionate about but they're not relevant or they're not directly connected to what's actually sustaining the business. So here's a really great example. If, uh, you know, occasionally I do public speaking for my business, I charge a small fee. I am not a public speaker business. I don't travel the country. It's things that I do on the side. And so if, if I'm going to, um, you know, I have the option to choose between, you know, let's say, let's say most of my money comes from social media. If I have the option between hiring someone for social media and hiring a public speaking coach, which I'm not knocking that, but if I had to choose between the two, I'm not going to choose the public speaking coach because even if that's a passion, like let's say that I love getting in front of people. I love the energy, the drive. I love seeing the reaction on people's faces. You know, when I tell a joke and I just know I'm hilarious and they're kind of like, you're not that funny, but I get what you're saying. You know, even if I love doing that, what's important for the business is the social media piece. And again, you may be thinking like, yeah, I get the concept, but a lot of us aren't actually self-aware enough to recognize that what we're driving in our business is actually not the most profitable for our business. So even if you have several positions that you need to fill or, or a level of tasks that you need to fill. You want to be strategic and thinking about, okay, what's most important for my business right now? 
Once you've done that, you hire specifically for that position. I need a social media person. Um, I'm I'm not getting um, I'm not responding to emails, keeping up with with current customers, other contacts as well as I need to do. You know, maybe and, and by the way, this isn't always just related to revenue. Sometimes this is related to like blind spots or weaknesses in our business. Uh, I keep missing appointments. I keep forgetting to put appointments on my calendar, what have you. I'm going to hire a virtual assistant or an executive assistant or someone who's going to help manage that for me because it's a real weakness for me. Or if you have a business that is uh, doing relatively well, but you hate sales, you're not good at it, it's awkward, it's clunky, clunky. you just want to do the work, you don't want to deal with sales, maybe you hire someone to take that over who's actually skilled and passionate about it so that you're not stressing about it and you're, you're diverting your creative, entrepreneurial, inspirational energy elsewhere. So you pick that position, you post that position, and then the next big thing is you pay accordingly in a way that, that, that says what you believe as a business when it comes to how you value your people. Meaning you can't both say, oh, I just, I so value my employees and pay minimum wage. I wish I could put a qualifier on that. Well, it's okay in this situation, but you can't. If you are paying a minimum wage position, if you're paying $7.25 an hour when a meal is going to cost someone $13, $14, you are not going to find talented employees. And frankly, it tells me a lot. When I meet someone who pays minimum wage, even someone who pays $10 an hour, what that does, I can tell you it immediately informs me as to what you think and value in terms of your talent and what you think about your business. That's not to me mean that's not meant to be judgmental. It is however meant to be challenging. Because where you want to take your business is directly tied to how well you're willing to invest in your business. That's not a savvy sales twist on, you know, yeah, and you know, spend money. Hey, spend money on good advice, you know, yada yada. It's the honest truth that how you invest in your business will dictate where your business goes. So me for the social media position, uh, I'm, I'm willing to pay over the average rate. I talked to a couple of people who, um, one's a hiring manager who helps connect people uh, to open positions. Um, I talked to someone who actually has, who runs a digital marketing company and hires social media people. And I said, hey, what do you think? And they were like, yeah, sounds great, go for it. So point being, I'm not looking to hire from the bottom of the barrel because I just know not only the kind of talent I'm going to get, um, but also what it says about my business. So you have to pay well. If you've listened to the podcast, you've heard nothing different on that, by the way. Um, it's pretty much what I say all the time. I have another episode called, Should You Pay Your People More? And I said, basically, yeah, you probably should. Um, so you need to pay them well. And then let's talk about the actual, like, how do you find applicants? How do you choose which applicants to interview? What does the interview process look like? And then where do you go from there? So the episode's about 20 minutes so far. We'll probably go for another 10 or 15 minutes and we'll wrap it up. So let's say you've gotten, like me, 70 applicants. And by the way, I, I've knocked bot programs that like crawl, um, uh, applicants and like automatically reject them and been like, come on, like, let's actually look at people. Uh, I, I, I think I've said that in the past, like knocking that my opinion now is a bit more, um, lukewarm in the sense of like the number of applicants you get that are wildly underqualified, not at all qualified. Like I had someone who applied for the social media position who's never done any social media whatsoever, uh, works at Dollar Tree, um, and uh, is like an assistant manager at Dollar Tree, and which nothing wrong with Dollar Tree, but the position that this person's in has nothing to do with social media. And, you know, basically in talking to this person, they were like, yeah, I, I just thought, you know, I've been kind of thinking about things on the side. I thought it'd be cool to like try out social media. And I was like, okay, well, yeah, um, I don't really want you, I don't really want to be your test project, but bottom line, 
oftentimes, and, and here's actually a, an insight, by the way, if you're trying to get hired, uh, this is just a very basic, this isn't going to be mind blowing, but this is just a very basic resume tip. Excuse me. This is just a very basic resume tip. You want your resume to reflect the job you're applying for. Otherwise, it communicates immediately that you are not qualified for the position. So when someone hires you, they're not looking at your resume to see that you have ever worked before. They're looking to see, has this person worked in my industry before? Or is this person able to do the job first glance, immediately gut reaction, yes or no? And so if you're hiring, if you're getting, um, you're applying for a social media marketing position and your resume doesn't say anything about social media marketing, it talks about like, you know, when I was 12 years old, I got my first job at Applebee's and I was a busser and here's like, you know, and you've, you've got the bullet points that's like successfully managed four tables with patrons and ensuring a positive customer experience. I'm not knocking your experience at Applebee's. I'm letting you know that your hirer just does not care. <laughs> that's simply what it is. They just do not care. What I care about is if I hire this person, are they going to be able to do the job? Do they understand social media marketing? So your resume should reflect that. Obviously, don't lie on your resume. Um, but on the same token, don't sell yourself short. I had a friend of mine who was looking to get into social media and he was like, yeah, I mean, I, I've never done it before, but I manage a YouTube channel. And I was like, dude, put that on there. Like that, that is interesting. That's social media relevant. That is a social media platform now. And so put YouTube on there. You know, it shows that you do content creation. It shows that you're consistent. Like this is important. Um, and he's like, well, who cares about my YouTube channel? I was like, your, your hirer does. <laughs> On the same token with your resume, another just very quick um, recruiting tip. And I'm a bit, I'm a bit, I'm a bit back and forth on this. I don't know how much stuff I would put on my resume that is divisive. Uh, you know, I voted, for, I am passionate about politics and I voted for this person in 2020. I just don't know if I would put that person on, if I would put that content on there. Now, if you're, if you're applying for like a political company, maybe. Um, and on the flip side, I think, although you may get rejected often, it will get you closer in sync with maybe a really great hire, hire a company that's going to hire you because you're basically laying it out there. Hey, this is what my value system is. This is what I care about. Uh, this is what is important to me. And Ideally, it's like dating. Maybe you find a, a recruiter or a, a company that says, oh, yeah, that's exactly who we want. Let's get that person. So that's why I say I'm back and forth on it. But in many cases, people are going to look at that and they'll be, they're going to think um, red flag. Frankly, they're going to think red flag because they're going to think this person is, <laughs> is going to talk politics constantly. It, this person could cause drama. Um, you know, this person could... Um, I just don't know. I just don't know. So uh, that's a personal opinion. You're welcome to disagree. Uh, I hope you continue to stand for things that you're passionate about. Uh, just don't put it on your resume. So <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. You know, just whatever. So, um, okay. Done with like the recruiting tips, the hiring tips, resume tips, whatever. But so you're the hirer. You're looking to make a great hire. You look at the resume. You make sure that this person actually can do the job that you want them to do. Next step, you interview them. Again, very basic stuff. Here's where people really screw this up is because, um, and by the way, this is also a challenge to you. If, if you do these things, you are sending the wrong message for your business, showing up to the interview late, showing up and making a joke about who are you again? Uh, I, sorry, I haven't read your resume. Tell me, tell me who you are again. Um, you know, showing up and making a, um, uh, an awkward joke, uh, commenting on anything physically ap apparent about the person. Um, you know, I think there's, there's smarter, savvier legal people out there who are just like, yes, do not do that. But the bottom line is, um, I actually had one person interview me one time who was like, Hey, tell me a joke. And I was like, I, I don't know a joke, man. So you, if you're trying to communicate the right things about your business, 
Hopefully your business values your employees, cares about them individually. They aren't just a cog in the machine. They are a valuable part of your business. There's a lot of PR out there where people say these things. You want that to be communicated from the first moment they walk in. It's basic. It's easy. So you want to have read the resume. You want to know about them. You want to already kind of know what you're going to ask them, you know? And the other part of this too is there's this really obnoxious habit where people try to trick their employees. Let's see what they do. Let's see what they're going to do. So I had a friend of mine who said he had a boss that whenever the applicant would be walking out, he'd have one of his employees put some trash like on the carpet, like on in the path. And the boss would be like, hey, you know, give him the handshake. Hey, the door's over there or I'll walk you out. And they'd, they'd, they'd walk and see, did the, did the interviewee pick up the trash? And they'd be like, mm, nope, sorry. You know, trash must be beneath them. And I always thought this was so dumb. I mean, really, this is, there's, there's no other way to cut this, by the way. <laughs> it is so dumb because you are, it, it's manipulative. It's, it's silly. It's, it's, you're trying to gain some deep insight because you lack the ability to gain that insight in the actual interview. And so you rely on these hacks, these tips, these silly things to try to learn what kind of person your applicant is when you should have just asked really great questions in the interview to glean that kind of information. So stay away from the stupid hacks. Uh, there's another one that I've talked about a million times called the dish trick where you offer your patron, your, your patron, you offer your, uh, um, I keep thinking customer, um, your interviewee, you offer them a cup of coffee or a drink or what have you. And then when it's done, if they offer to take the mug to the break room and clean it out, this person is a great hire. If they don't stay away, they're not a team player. Like that's verbatim what I've seen expressed. So the other one I've heard of is the laundry trick where they take a, you bring the applicant into the interview room and there is a pile of laundry on the table. And then you I will be right back. You walk out and you wait like 10 minutes. And when you come back, if the applicant has folded the laundry, it means they're a great hire. This person, the, the laundry's not beneath them. They're a team player. This is the dumbest thing I've ever heard, honestly. If I'm sitting in, again, think about like first, first impressions here. If I'm applying for a job and your underwear is on a table in front of me, I'm weirded out. I think you're a weirdo. And I'm wondering, am I, did I come to the right place? Like, this is weird. Uh, this kind of stuff does not fly. I don't know why I'm even having to say not to do this kind of stuff, but I've seen people promote it. So I have to be like, don't do that. Um, you're you're, you're going to find a great hire, not through this stupid stuff, these silly tricks. You're going to find a great hire by being a great interviewer. So let's talk about some ways that you can do that. Naturally, like I mentioned, you want to know what's on the resume. You want to know a little bit about them. But honestly, the, the kind of interview style that I really appreciate, it's called behavioral questioning, behavioral interviewing, where you're trying to glean information about their character. I'm not talking religious or you know, you're, and you're not, you're not asking like basic moral stuff like, Hey, yeah. So would you ever steal from a business? You know, like no one's going to be like, uh, well, yes. Um, Hey, would you ever murder someone? No. Oh, okay, cool. Nice. Uh, you're hired. You're asking stuff that reflects on the kind of person they are and how they, what the worldview is. So like me, for example, a question, uh, and for me, it's not just character. Sometimes it's maturity. So like I, I will, um, you know, we'll have a conversation. I try to be very genuine. I try to pull back um, the heaviness that sometimes people feel in an interview. I want them to be themselves. I don't want them to be, you know, um, stressed out. And so I try to make conversation, you know, try to joke. And that's just who I am as a person. Like if you're going to work with me, this is me. But I will ask a question that I really like to ask, which is, hey, tell me about a time that you disagreed with your boss and what happened and how'd you handle it? Or I'll say, hey, tell me about a time that um, you disagreed with a customer. What happened? And these aren't like moments to give them like the opportunity just to vent. It's like you're asking them, 
you know, and you're also not asking like g- general things like, you know, hey, yeah, you, have you ever disagreed with your boss before? Yeah, I have. And like, did you handle that okay? Yes, I did. Like, you're not doing that. You are asking for a specific moment so that you can see what did they do so you can learn the kind of person that they are. Obviously, you're not going to learn like the inner depths of their soul, but you are going to get some insight. So like, here's, here's another example of a question that was asked and the response that the person gave. I was interviewing someone who was um, coming from another position where they had been in charge of like building a website, basically. They were working for another business and they were building a website. And I said, the question maybe was like something, I have no idea what the question was, but theoretically the question was something like, um, you know, tell me about a project you worked on where uh, things changed very quickly or there were um, a multitude of challenges that made the problem difficult. And so, you know, what you're trying to get, what you're trying to glean is like, how does this person re- re- uh, respond to um, fires that pop up, challenges you didn't expect? And, and naturally, you're looking for someone maybe who thinks outside the box, who's entrepreneurial. I know in my job, that's what I'm looking for. And so um, this question, like I asked this question like this, and the person's like, oh, yeah, it was like so many issues. Like it took forever to get the website up and running and yada, yada, yada. And uh, it's still not running. It's been eight months. We still don't have the website up. And and this person's also communicating like this was his job and he still hasn't done it yet eight months later. And I I basically asked like, well, I mean, so like you're applying for this job, like what's going to happen to the website? And he goes, that's someone else's problem. And I was like, man, that was the wrong answer. <laughs> that's really not the right answer. And this person was kind of saying it half jokingly. But I just thought, ooh, that, that, that says a little bit about the way you see things like this. Now, again, I'm not going to like blast this person on social media. Do I really, am I, am I a therapist or a psychoanalyst who like I have a deep understanding of this person? No. And when you interview someone, you have 30 minutes, maybe an hour to get as much insight as you can from this person and to make a judgment call. And so you're going to make the best judgment call that you can in terms of is this person the right fit? Do they, do they blend well in our business? And, and by the way, it's not always related to like character. You know, it's not always, um, and, and actually before we say that, let me give you another example. Maybe you ask like, give me a time about like a time you disagreed with an employee or a coworker and they say something like, yeah, you know, I really, I realized I was thinking about, you know, why were they not seeing it my way? And I was, and like, so you're gleaning from this conversation that, you know, they're introspective, they're, they're empathetic, they're thinking of other people, yada, yada. Or that versus like, oh, that person was a real pain in my rear and oh, they were always on my back and which may be true, by the way, there could have been like a really crazy <laughs> coworker. But again, you're, you're gleaning as best you can. How does this person approach their daily work? Now, it's not always related to just character. Sometimes you're trying to get an idea of how, what is this person's value system and how well does it align with your value system? Sometimes it aligns very well right off the bat. Other times it it really doesn't. And so the person's a perfectly qualified person. They have amazing character. They're, they are, they would be a good employee, but you just don't see business the same way. Like the way good advice operates in terms of how we work with our customers, we have a very particular way that we see our customers and that is that we're here to serve them. And, I, and here's what's kind of silly. is like everyone says this. Not everyone actually practices this. Um, but we try to be generous with our services. We try to be specific in terms of outcomes. And we try to do right by our customers. That's something that's important to us. A lot of people will say that about their business, but it's not always an explicit value and it's not always demonstrated. So it's not really a great example because like you're probably listening being like, yeah, everyone should do that. Um, but the point being, here's actually a better example. I had a customer of mine who developed, um, uh, Trump greeting cards. And so you get a birthday card and he would put Trump's voice. That would be like, you know, I wish you the very best birthday ever you could ever have, whatever. Uh, and so one of his values was humor. And so he did this with Trump. He did this with Hillary Clinton. He did this with like a bunch of different people. And his whole point, his whole stick was to make people laugh. Like you get this birthday card, like, oh, that's so funny. That's really great. I actually had one of his products and I showed it to a group, uh, a networking group. And someone immediately was like, hey, can I have that? That's such a great gag gift. Um, 
So like talking to the business owner, one of his values was humor. I'm trying to make people laugh. I'm not trying to make a political statement. So you can have someone who comes on, who who applies for a position, who's an amazing individual, but for them, it is more politically driven. It's like, hey, I do, I want to communicate a a greater message here. Um, I'm less interested in the humor piece. Uh, I don't want to joke about things that are really important to me or like my future generation or what have you. So do you see like the difference here? Like you can have someone who's a great candidate, but the values aren't in sync. And when that happens, this is maybe one of the most important things is you have to be willing to tell someone you're not a good fit here. We're going to keep looking, even if you're really strapped to get this position hired. What is more painful having to wait another two weeks to hire a position or hiring someone that you onboard for 30 days, they quit and now you're back to square one. Or worse, you see the signs that they're not a good fit, six months go by and now you're firing that person. They they you know are bitter at your business. They're posting on social media about you, what have you. Like that's why you have to be willing to have the conversation early on. And I've had to have that conversation. I've had to have that conversation with people who were amazing on paper, but like, as we talked, it was kind of like, okay, I don't know if I'm feeling this. Are you feeling this? You know? And like us kind of getting to the point of being like, yeah, this isn't a good fit anymore. Or this isn't a good fit to go further. It's okay to have those conversations. Don't be desperate to fill a chair in your office. Hire the right person. Hire the right person. And oddly enough, now I'm saying the opposite. Uh, don't also take forever about it. Once you find that candidate, give them a seat, let them try it out and give them real feedback. So uh, there's another episode I do call throw out annual reviews. They're too slow. I still feel that way. I think if you're looking to hire someone who you don't have to talk to until a year from now, uh, that person is going to move on very quickly. So take care of your people, give them feedback, pay them well and hire for a very specific position. Uh, and those will set you on your way. So, hey, if you have any more insights about the hiring process, I'd love to hear from you. You can email me, Blake at goodadvicecoaching.com. If you need help with hiring, hiring right people, and more importantly, having an amazing all-star culture that people love to work in, you can also email us. We'll give you some extra help. And uh, having said that, the podcast, we continue to promote it, post it, and what have you. If you want to promote your own business on the podcast, you can do that as well. Simply reach out to me again, Blake at goodadvicecoaching.com or check out our Patreon, patreon.com slash goodadvice. That's all we have for you today. That is our good advice. And I appreciate you listening. Take care. We'll see you later.